and mining analysts market perspective. Uh, I'm Peter Nicholson from Resource Capital Funds and today we're being joined by Reg Spencer from Canaccord, Helen Lau from Argonaut, Peter Arden from Bell Potter and Adrian Prendergast from Morgans. You can find everybody's bios on the uh, Minds of Money uh, website. We're not going to go through detailed introductions in the interest of time. Um, but today, Reg will be talking about how appropriate is the post-GFC playbook in a global pandemic recovery. Helen will talk about China and industrial metals. Peter will be talking about views on lithium and Adrian will be talking about iron ore. And then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So please submit questions uh, via the chat function on that. And for now, I'll pass over to Reg to talk about how appropriate the post GSC playbook is. Reg. Thanks, Peter. Uh, at Canaccord, we've been uh, watching, <laughs> as everyone has, I'm sure, uh, the markets play out uh, in, in response to the COVID pandemic, uh, specifically to try to get a feel for what could happen based on what has happened in the past. You know, we, we look back to the last major market correction or economic shock uh, in recent memory, and that was a global financial crisis. Now, at, at Canaccord, we, we do see a, a somewhat similar economic backdrop as what we saw uh, during the GFC uh, with respect to uh, the, the scale of it, um, but one might also argue that the scale of this economic shock could be much larger. So at Canaccord, you know, the, the, the way that we've been looking at this market is if you look back to the GFC, uh, which commodity markets perform best uh, in the middle of that crisis and then leading out of it as, as the cycle turned, um, and gold really stands out to us. So if we do go back to the global financial crisis where we saw gold um, fall by about 30% uh, to about $700 an ounce in, in late 2008. And then over the course of the next two or three years, uh, it, it then peaked at about $1,900. And, and uh, the, the key drivers behind that were obviously uh, the large scale fiscal and, and monetary sim stimulus um, re really centered upon uh, the, the US, uh, what they termed as quantitative easing. Now, fast forward to 2020, uh, we're seeing a, a very similar thing play out in response to the economic town downturn and global central banks attempts to uh, stimulate the economy. We have seen again, uh, huge fiscal and monetary stimuluses. And, and we think that's going to uh, uh, be a driver of, of significant uh, gains in, in the gold price. Um, so in the current environment, you know, we, we, we do see gold's appeal um, uh, uh, to be, to, to make it one of the better market opportunities, especially when we look at uh, ongoing swelling, let's call it, of, of central bank balance sheets. Um, noting that the US Fed's balance sheet has expanded by 40% uh, just since the start of the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, we have a, a global uh, interest rate environment that is uh, almost at zero. Uh, and then if you have a look at um, real rates, they're all actually negative. Uh, you've got $10 trillion of negative yielding debt uh, globally. Uh, then you've got safe haven demand. So a lot of those you know, fear factors that, that drove the gold price uh, to those highs uh, in 2008, we see could be very supportive factors um, in 2020. Now, as we come through this, and, and uh, I guess trying to forecast how long um, this market is going to be like this for is, is fraught with danger. Uh, but uh, as we see the reflation trade play out, as we see the trillions of dollars that have effectively been printed start to flow through the economy, um, you know, we would then look to um, more of your industrial uh, metal markets and industrial commodities uh, to, to uh, be a, a better opportunity to uh, play uh, on, on a global economic recovery. And, and in that, you're looking at the coppers, the base metals, iron ore, um, and something that, that uh, one of my compatriots here will be talking about, things like battery materials and lithium. So, um, like I said, uh, the, the post GFC playbook, uh, while uh, having different, uh, having spawned from a, a different uh, setup, um, actually is is turning out uh, to date uh, in in a similar fashion, and, and we see similar opportunities in the markets um, as as this plays out. Excellent, thanks for that, Reg. Um, if we go to Helen to talk about China and industrial metals, please. Yep. Um, hi, uh, yeah, um, certainly I think um, given the current background that uh, China has um, 
has put this uh, virus outbreak under control and also launched a lot of uh, stimulus uh, packages to support the economy growth. So I think there's a lot of um, opportunities in this commodity space, especially in the base metals, including some other industrial metals. So the metals that I'm very interested, I think, included um, iron ore, um, copper, and nickel. And um, so the, the the reason for that is not only the prices has been driving, because it has been driven has been has been driven up because of the because of the demand re recovery uh, after the. Um, after China lifted the lockdowns. Uh, and also um, this uh, uh, demand recovery has also resulted in um, um, declining in inventory. So there's a less and less uh, inventory risks. At, at, at the same time, because of the demand is pretty good, quite solid. So the pricing has been um, very good. So therefore the, the probability of uh, steel, for example, or profitability of other processing uh, companies are also improving. So that in turn is also driving up the uh, minerals demand, for example, iron ore, right? And, uh, and in addition, as I mentioned, China has launched uh, this uh, monetary support, physically, you know, physical support. So um, China issued a lot of uh, the, the Lot uh, issued a lot of government um, bonds and all of that. I think I have identified that there's uh, some fund flow into futures. Actually, what I have observed is the future prices has been increasing at a faster pace than the spot prices. So, um, so definitely there's a concern about maybe some slow, uh, you know, a little bit pullback or consolidation. But however, um, we think because the underlying demand is still increasing and still rising. Uh, and so therefore, I think uh, um, the, the, the risks of a consolidation in the spot prices uh, and also in the, in the future prices are, are not that, uh, are, are not very likely. And, and at the same time, if we look around, you know, there's um, a lot of uh, countries are also coming out of the lockdowns. So that is another, I think that will add some extra demand for, for industrial metals, right? And uh, lastly, I think there's uh, still some supply risks uh, across the board, especially in South America and also in, in, South, A in South Asian countries. So, so therefore, we can see the nickel ore uh, inventory in China has declined so much because of, because of uh, there's a there's a not much supply from uh, from uh, Philippines, right? And uh, therefore, the nickel ore in the prices has has been going up. The same things happens uh, in South America, where um, there's a still some disruption there in 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 copper mining, and also. You know, things happened in Brazil, where it's also the iron ore mining is also being affected. So that's why I think we're still in a stage, uh, still in a stage where we see um, supply and demand is pretty good, and I think um, it's a very um, favorable uh, for for prices to go higher. So that's my view. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, and Peter, can you tell us some views on lithium, please? Thanks, Peter. So um, the lithium sector has never been known for its transparency. Um, while there have been some improvements in that situation over the past year or so, I believe it's been a contributing factor to where the lithium market sadly find themselves today. Lithium has been severely buffeted in the past two years with the prices for all lithium mineral products falling dramatically from their peak levels that occurred around early 2018. And at that time, the outlook for electric vehicles, EVs, and related new generation battery storage was very buoyant, underpinned by growing, growing subsidies for EVs and before an avalanche of new lithium supply started to hit the market. Since then, we have seen the prices for all lithium mineral products decline severely, uh, roughly in rough terms by 60 to 70 percent under the combined influences of slower demand growth, reduced EV subsidies 
and significant growth in the production of lithium concentrate and raw materials that's resulted in significant stockpiles of those concentrates and products in the hands of converters and customers. Now, this has led to the unhappy position we are in today of low lithium prices at a time of reduced lithium demand from the global impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we see the sector trying to show patchy signs of recovery, but it's doing so in a world of much lower growth and greater uncertainty. Now, the opaqueness of lithium markets uh, doesn't help us look too far into the future, but there are some significant and potentially slightly positive aspects developing. Uh, all the big car makers have plans to make major new investments in EV capacity and new models and to boost the sales of EVs in the next few years. <clears throat> and in cases like Toyota, uh, they are looking to bring the uh, EV component to where it's the dominant um, uh, type of uh, uh, a car in the middle of the decade. As well, uh, cathode manufacturers are programming further capacity expansions in Europe and Asia to meet the demand even in 22 and 23. Perhaps somewhat surprisingly, however, China has been a bit of a laggard relative to Europe, particularly in driving the expected EV recovery, given that China theoretically came out of the depths of the COVID effects earlier than other major industrialized nations. There have been some supportive moves on the EV subsidy front in China that might be effective in building some positive momentum and overcoming what has really been a reluctance by many of the small to medium sized Chinese battery makers and converters to take on new orders, particularly while they have, and the Chinese lithium sector overall still has these significant stockpiles of concentrate and products. And many of those Chinese businesses have been through tough financial times over the past two years, and are still, some of them are still wearing the scars of that. So overall, while there's still some ongoing issues in the sector's recovery, there continue to be favorably some very strong forecasts for the sector to continue to see something like the growth that was forecast a year or two back. Uh, and that really relates to the demand for EVs and new storage batteries, uh, which has been a powerful thematic for lithium and we see it potentially being that again. <clears throat> One potential for the longer term health of production on the lithium production side is the fact that with this downturn, we are now seeing um, a deferral and potential uh, curtailment of new pro projects to bring lithium uh, into production. <clears throat> Finally, the weakness in the lithium price has not deterred everyone in the sector. Uh, and in keeping with the theme that we see developing largely in Australia, but elsewhere, regarding some quite amazing spate of significant new exploration successes, which range from nickel, uh, gold, palladium, uh, we continue to see some, express, some impressive exploration results coming through for lithium and the likes of Liontown Resources and Core Lithium, for instance, recently announcing further extensions to their deposits and at grades that indicate they would be economic um, and worth developing even at these low prices. So there is some hope there. Thanks. Thanks for that, Peter. And just before we go from the, the lows of lithium to the highs of iron ore, just encourage people again, as a reminder, you can ask questions through the chat function for after Adrian's spiel, um, we'll go to, to Q&A. So Adrian on iron ore, please. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, it, it is really quite the inverse of what's been happening with um, the lithium price. So iron ore has been just going from strength to strength over the last couple of years. And really through all different phases um, that we've seen a couple of different transitions in, in um, demand conditions or global growth conditions, but it still has managed to remain really consistently strong. So why is that? 
um, really digging into it, um, demand has been really quite resilient. We've really seen uh, China sustaining that um, you know, circa 1 billion tonnes to, to just over 1 billion tonnes per year of steel output. So certainly using it in, in a big way and producing it. Um, uh, also supportive has been the fact that despite the really high levels of, of steel activity, we're still seeing really good digestion um, of, of inventory. So uh, we, we did have a, a bigger buildup um, uh, earlier in 2020 uh, in terms of finished steel uh, products uh, that were certainly being uh, produced far ahead of what was being consumed, especially when we hit uh, COVID-19, which, which did obviously also cause a big impact in China, especially uh, as a, a you know, key steel market. But since then, uh, those uh, stockpiles of, of finished steel products has been really uh, coming down quite handsomely. We've also seen really good throughput of um, iron ore tons through Chinese ports where, where stockpiles were also being digested really quite handsomely. So um, obviously uh, the Ch Chinese economy has rebounded really quite strongly from COVID-19. We've really seen a um, you know, very aligned country that has reacted really well to um, the restrictions brought on by the government um, leading to fast containment and, um, and from that quick uh, recovery in uh, things like construction activity, which is obviously pretty important for steel. So um, now we've also got stimulus kicking in. Um, so we, we had gotten to a position where we we're starting to get a little bit concerned around what would happen uh, for the iron ore price from such great highs on, on a quick China recovery for the rest of 2020. But that has also now reversed, um, at least in the short term, back to a very positive view. We really see some, um, some more significant upside for iron ore prices from here. That's been driven by the supply, supply dynamics, which has really been the core feature um, of iron ore strength over the last couple of years. So um, in, in 2019, we saw serious supply issues or, or, or um, numerous impacts to the, the big miners, especially the Australians with um, different weather and operating conditions um, dragging on their tons, uh, ship tons at a time when there was really quite resilient uh, and, and consistent consumption of steel. So, um, uh, so that really led to 2019 strength. But in 2020, we've now had a compounding of some of these supply issues, more, more around um, Brazil, which is the home of the second largest seaborne iron ore producer, Vale. So Vale, um, as I'm sure everyone's well aware from, from uh, press coverage in previous years, uh, unfortunately have had two very large recent telling stam tragedies that have brought on really stringent and, and very strong oversight from the government in terms of restrictions around their operations. That, that's persisted way uh, beyond what we thought and much of the market thought they would. So they still have significant portions of their operations in Brazil restricted and, um, and trying to adhere to uh, new standards in terms of um, safety uh, around those mine sites. So, so that's already led to a number of downgrades to 2020 guidance for uh, Vale in terms of their iron ore volumes. And um, so that's already before COVID-19. Now, unfortunately, as Helen touched on, um, we have seen quite severe uh, COVID-19 impacts in South America, especially Brazil, as I'm sure everyone's aware. And, and certainly, um, Vale is not immune to that. So what's happened more recently is we've seen the government step in to suspend um, operations in part of uh, Vale's network affecting about 10% of its capacity because of the amount of COVID-19 infections on site at, at these um, three operations that have been impacted. Uh, so that's further restricting their ability to, to um, respond and get their volumes back up. And, and since then, we've also seen now an investigation from a prosecutor's office in, into the para region of Brazil, which is a, an even more uh, mining heavy region for Vale and, and about a third of their, their total capacity. So we don't know if suspensions will result from that investigation, but certainly there is potential for it, given how prolific uh, the virus has been through the region. So ultimately, um, Vale had already cut its guidance for 2020 from um, 330 to 355 million tonnes down to 310 to, uh, to 330. So um, even just to achieve the low end of that downgraded guidance, uh, we estimate that um, uh, they would need to sustain an average of just over um, 7 million tonnes per week of iron ore shipments for the remainder of the year. Whereas so far they've averaged in, in the high threes and, and, um, and currently uh, Brazil as a country is exporting about 5.4 million tonnes per week. So it's so, uh, still certainly well shy. So what we see for iron ore at the moment is um, we've gone from a picture in 2020 of marginal to potentially moderate surplus on weakening demand 
um, to now having quite tight demand uh, supply conditions um, because of these issues that ha have rocked uh, South America and Brazil, especially uh, where thankfully our Australian miners are, are quite immune given how remote the Pilbara region is and how well Western Australia has done as a state um, to begin with. So um, yeah, we, in terms of iron ore prices, we're still hovering around that um, $100 mark for fines, uh, US dollars per tonne. Really see potential if there are more weighty suspensions um, hitting um, Vale for that to, to spike before it starts to moderate over the remainder of the year. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Adrian. Appreciate that. So we've got uh, about eight minutes for Q&A. Um, and the first one through is for all panellists asking, is it harder for explorers, mid-tiers or majors during this time? So um, if we just go through in the order we spoke, Reg. Oh, well, clearly it's going to be hard for the explorers. Uh, the key source of their funding for their activities is the equity markets. And uh, uh, like what we saw in March when, when we hit peak panic, uh, on, on the back of COVID, uh, equity markets were effectively shut um, and, and more so for, for those earlier stage exploration companies. Uh, but uh, in, in the most part, we have seen a lot of these guys uh, be able to raise money or, or at least in the months leading up to the pandemic. And we, we're seeing the fruits of their labour now with a number of discoveries being made, especially in Western Australia and gold and, and nickel. Um, uh, but but yeah, to answer the question, it, it's, it's certainly more difficult for exploration companies in this environment, in my opinion. Thanks, Reg. Helen? Yep. Um, yep. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. I think yeah, um, there's uh, still um, there's uh, still a lot of uh, suspicion um, about um, the mining sector overall, uh, talking about the exploration. Uh, and uh, I think yeah, there's uh, still a lot of uh, uncertainties. You know, the, the investment community, I, I find, is totally different from the uh, mining industry. So investors have a rather optimistic view, but I find that um, uh, for investors investing in, in juniors or, you know, so they have a rather very cautious view. So therefore, I do have found, um, you know, the exploration budget has not recovered to the previous level. So that is another reason why we think that will be quite supportive to the price recovery, especially in the industrial uh, metals uh, space. Thanks, Helen. Peter? Yeah, look, I, I think the big driver um, in exploration always uh, and it's being played out now is some um, success. And as Reg touched on, and we are definitely seeing it at Bell Potter, uh, there is phenomenal interest in exploration success because we are really going through a major uh, lift in success. Um, and it's not just WA, um, the backwater where I live in um, Victoria has seen a significant new discovery, uh, gold discovery by uh, uh, Chalice uh, Gold Mines. Um, near Bendigo and it's a still fairly recent event that the Fosterville mine not far away has become almost overnight one of the world's greatest gold mines. So exploration success is very important and we are seeing it filter down to the smaller companies. We are seeing investors happy to uh, sort of live the dream of a major discovery. Uh, in the Fraser Range, we've seen legend um, make a very significant discovery uh, after so many others have left. So I think the, uh, the ingredients are there and um, there's nothing like success. Adrian? Yeah, I agree with those comments. I do think it is the, the toughest for the small guys, obviously access to capital, even trumps um, quality of assets sometimes. And, and certainly as Peter just said, I think the access to capital is there, the market's interested um, in new growth. So yeah, I'll just leave it there. Thanks for that. Um, they did want my views too, which is I think explorers can batten down very well and they have proven that over the years, but it's the the people with the the marginal producers that are going to struggle the most as you see uh, the demand drop off and the prices drop because you can lose money very quickly as a producer. So that answers that one. The next question, um, Adrian, for you is uh, what impact do you see Samandu having on the iron ore market? 
Yeah, really good question. Um, uh, and I, was, I realized I was a little low on time, so I probably cut it off before I got to my long-term views. But um, yeah, Samandu is really interesting dynamic. You know, you've got Chinese investment there, you know, huge scale iron ore deposit in, in um, Africa that um, really I, I think is, is certain to come on stream and really will curb um, supply or, or iron ore prices in the long term. So, you know, we come up against a lot of robust bulls in, in the market uh, in iron ore trying to roll things like current spot prices through our models into perpetuity to see what the results are for companies like Fortescue. But, you know, uh, in Samandu, you've got um, you know, China, a Chinese group who, who is essentially the they're big consumers of, the, of um, the raw material invested in what is quite a massive scale project that will help to, to moderate even if we, um, if we don't see it in, in the nearer term. So, yeah, I think it will just be a, a balancing act on, on any long-term um, price assumptions you might have. So I just think you can't assume anything above marginal cost of 60 to $65 for iron ore, and, and Samandu is a big reason for that. Thanks for that. And then Helen, um, still on iron ore, but with the bilateral relationship between China and Australia hitting recent lows, uh, will China try and source iron ore imports elsewhere? Yeah, um, sorry, uh, it is about the um, political tensions between China and Australia, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. I think, yeah, I think from my point of view, I think China is still reliant on the imports of all of these minerals. So all of this so far, the tariff increase on the um, Australian products are mainly food or beef or meat, right? They haven't touched on the most important commodities. What I meant is iron ore. And maybe they have uh, banned some, a little bit import of coal, but China is uh, really structurally oversupplied with coal. So, you know, China, you know, with this potential or not, China still needs to um, have this import quota on their total imports. So therefore, I think the coal imports restriction is not really related to the political tensions. Um, so, so the bottom line is that um, I think so far it's only the, you know, the, the political tensions, I think will not really affect um, the imports of uh, iron ore and some other uh, bauxite and other very important minerals that China really heavily rely on. And, uh, yeah, so I think uh, Australia should continue to enjoy, um, you know, a lot of the imports of uh, minerals from China and uh, so far, because there's a few, there's no alternatives for China to be able to import such a, such a big amount of iron ore or some other materials, uh, minerals from other places. So, so that's why uh, I think uh, uh, we should, so that's at least that is my base case uh, scenario uh, analysis. Thanks, and a very quick one, uh, Reg. Um, base metals are upside, copper and zinc. Do you have a view? And we have just over a minute. One minute. Uh, upside copper, uh, both supply and demand driven. Discovery rates for for copper have been falling for many many years now. And uh, on the demand side, uh, copper is going to be a, a major beneficiary uh, of electrification of, of transport and, and, uh, and, and renewable energy uh, into the grid. Um, so from that perspective alone, uh, we, we think it's got a, a, a better outlook. Um, that said, uh, in the shorter term, as we roll out of the, uh, the post GFC, you know, industrial minerals and, and base metal markets like those uh, should be or should benefit from, from an uptick in economic activity and demand. But, but over the longer run, we, we do expect copper to outperform. Thanks for that. And um, we need to, to wrap up, but I, I like to push the time limits. We'd get automatically cut off, but Peter, one word, what commodity have we not mentioned that people should think about investing in? Uh, maybe palladium, it's a uh, commodity that um, is very rare, the sources of it, in the Soviet, in Russia and South Africa make it highly risky. Excellent, thanks for that. Look, that is going to be time for us. So I'd like to thank the panelists, Reg Spencer, Helen Lau, Peter Arden and Adrian Prendergast.